Good morning, everyone. A hearty welcome to this class and this course. My name is Joe Mehevic, and I am a visiting professor at York University and moderator and facilitator for today's uh, session. Yes, this is COVID time, and it's a challenge to us all. But we hope to present to you with this class, this common curriculum, a wonderful experience that you will remember. It is a special kind of class that we are offering uh, this fall term. The co-sponsors of uh, this uh, program are the institutions at the bottom, listed at the bottom of the page. First, it's the City of Toronto, whom, to whom we are very grateful as educators from the eight other institutions for the work that they put into this, what we're calling the common curriculum. They have made it possible. They have put together very fine speakers, as you will see this week and in the weeks following, that will uh, give you a real sense of how City Hall functions and what the key issues City Hall is facing uh, these days. Working with, the, with City Hall has been a great experience in collaboration at a deep le level and an exercise in practical knowledge. The community colleges and universities that you see at the bottom of the page, Centennial, George Brown, Humber, OCAD, Ryerson, Seneca, U of T, and York University are all in this class. There are students representing all those institutions, and of course, we heartily welcome you uh, to, this, to this course and to this class. Let's start with the land acknowledgement. We recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which colleges and university campuses are located that precede their establishment. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been cared taken by the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. We also acknowledge all treaty people, including those who came here as settlers, as migrants, either in this generation or in generations past, and those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly forcibly displanted Africans brought here as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. To personalize this, I myself am grateful to this land for hosting my family who were refugees after World War II. Yet I know and am committed as by part of my responsibility, personal responsibility in this acknowledgement to work for a more socially just Toronto, Ontario, and Canada. So as I was saying, this class is not uh, being taught by uh, City of Toronto staff alone or myself alone, of course. It is, there is a, a wide breadth of people, faculty for this course. They include from Centennial, Shane Walker, from George Brown, Leslie Wee. Leslie Wee will be moderating the class on September 24th. From Humber, there is Elizabeth Fanuda, OCAD, Glenn Lowry, from Ryerson, there is Sharice Berta and Pamela Robinson. From Seneca, Gus Lynn Pelusi. Uh, University of Toronto is uh, David Roberts and myself from York University. I would be uh, remiss not to also mention Jeff Moore from the Partnership Office at the City of Toronto, who is doing a lot of the heavy lifting on the city side, pulling together the uh, speakers along with Manjeet Singh, who you will hear from in a second. In terms of housekeeping, these are things that all students from all colleges and universities know for this particular class and this particular course. <clears throat> Today's session, all the sessions are being recorded and participants are asked not to share any personal information within the meeting. It creates all kinds of privacy, cons privacy issues that uh, are better dealt with through not sharing uh, personal information. The session will be available on the Toronto.ca and Civic Lab TO websites 
and will also be made available to your instructor in the near future. And though that tape will include AODA compliant captioning. There will be time for Q and A's towards the end of today's event. If you'd like to submit a question during the session, please enter it into the chat feature at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. For those connected through uh, WebEx, uh, who, who are connected to WebEx through smartphones, if you are in an area of poor cell service and relying solely on data, you may experience a buffering and you may want to call the meeting instead. My suggestion is that all of you, every one of you, do a screenshot right now, shift control three, and there you'll have the numbers then uh, right at hand. And then if you need them, you can call in. Um, everyone will be manually muted during today's event. And very important, next week's class will be at your home university or college. Your professor has given you instructions on its format. Our next WebEx class, moderated again by Leslie Wee from George Brown, will be on September 24th at 9.30. Today's speaker, we have five speakers from the City of Toronto. First, we are going to hear from Deputy Mayor Anna Bailao, also City Councillor, to give a hearty uh, welcome from the elected side of City Hall. Then we'll hear from Manjeet Jita, Director, Strategic Partnerships, Civic Labs at TO, who will put the course in the context of the larger City Hall commitment to building closer relationships between the colleges, universities, and City Hall. Then we're gonna hear from the three very senior people at the City of Toronto. Chris Murray is the city manager, who would be responsible for pulling it all together at a very high level. He is responsible for 30,000 to 60,000 staff, depending on how you count, uh, bringing together the uh, directions that the City Council give him and implementing the uh, solutions that are put forth. We have John Elvidge, who is the city clerk, who manages all the information flows at the City of Toronto. Followed, uh, following John will be Stephen Conforti, who's the executive director of financial planning, and he's going to talk about money in the city and what, uh, what, uh, how things happen on the financial side. At the very end, you'll hear from Shan Shergill. He is a student in this class. He's also the president of the Federation of Urban Studies students at York University to give a thank you. So we'll start with Deputy Mayor Anna Bai Lau. Welcome, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Joe. So nice to see you and to be here with all of you, all our senior staff that will be presenting throughout the day and in particularly um, the students uh, that are joining us here um, today and for this course and thank you to all the professors <clears throat> that are joining us in this program and uh, and that have joined this initiative. Uh, to all the students that are starting a new academic year, I know that has been, you know, challenging times uh, for all of us and in particular when you're going through university, you know, everybody tells you it's the best years of your life, enjoy every minute. So um, I, I do hope that uh, you're finding ways to enjoy your growth and your learning, even though we're living through some very, very challenging times. And that when you look back, this experience uh, with the Civic Lab TO will be part of that. Um, so I'm very, very, very excited about this, this partnership, about the launch of, of this partnership. I've had several conversations about uh, the potential of these partnerships with our senior staff so I'm very pleased to be joining you here today. And let me tell you why some of the reasons that I'm so excited about this. First of all is we, we need to promote our city as a place of employment, right? So you're, you're studying, you're great at doing great things out there. We really hope that, you know, one day you think of the city of Toronto as possibly a place to come and, and share with us your skills, your knowledge, and your professional career. So I think opening those horizons, I think it's very important. I know that first experience. I never thought I would end up working at the City of Toronto. And if that opportunity wasn't given to me to come in and work in my last year of university, I wouldn't have thought 
to come in here. I didn't have those networks. So I think that this opportunity is really important for, for students in that way. The second, uh, the second point is we have amazing institutions, uh, in uh, education institutions in our city. And so I think that uh, as a city, we know that not all the answers, even though some people might not think so, not all the answers are within the four walls of City Hall. We need to go out. We need to, to have these conversations uh, out there with the communities, which we always do with public consultations and so on. But why not engage some of the most successful educational institutions and their amazing students in these conversations, in addressing some of the challenges that we have? in making sure that the conversations, the solutions, the challenges are also part of, of uh, their curriculum and their discussions, their studies, and that there's an interchange of information and goals in here. And finally, um, I think uh, it, is, it is really important that we're, we're almost like a little lab in here. We wanna be leaders in this city. We wanna be leaders in education institutions. So let's challenge each other. Let's make sure we try some of new solutions. Let's make sure that uh, the, our education institutions and you as students can say, you know what, we were part of this course. We put forward some of these conversations, solutions, uh, challenges, and, and we know that it works and show to the world uh, the innovative side of Toronto and how we can address some of these issues. And we're not starting from zero. Let's be honest, we have a great, great city um, you know, people come from the four corners of the world in here. We have good quality of life. It's a city where people feel that sense of opportunity. Um, I know that when I got here at age 15, I definitely, that, that was what amazed me most about of Toronto is that you felt that sense of opportunity. But I think as, as, as I stayed in Toronto, as I grew up, and, uh, and you, you keep learning through your life, and, and in particular when we're challenged with things like a pandemic, you see how fragile these things are and that we can't take it for granted. And that change comes at you very, very fast and how you respond to those cha that change is really important. So the city of Toronto is a city that is growing at a very, very rapid pace. It is, um, a, its inequalities are growing at a very rapid place. You know, you, you, you have studies that show the growth of inequality in the city of Toronto. You have climate change that is a, an issue here for not only our city, for the world, but how is the city going to respond to that? You have financial challenges. We have, you know, 21st century issues uh, and solutions, and we still have a governance model that only give us financial tools you know, the same way it did 150 years ago. Uh, we, we are competing on a global scale for talent, for investments, for jobs. So all these are big, big challenges that we can only address if we create movements, if we create knowledge, and we attract the best in our, in our city to come and join us um, as, at, as at City Hall, or at least in these movements. So, that's what I'm really hoping that we both can get uh, uh, from this course. Uh, I think we'll, we're all students here. That's the way that I look at it. I hope that, you know, people uh, from the city that join you as well, that they are sharing information with you, but also listen to what you say, uh, listen to some of the suggestions and, and practical uh, um, things that, that can, can come from, from these discussions. Um, and that uh, we all uh, learn uh, together from this course. So thank you so much. I hope this is a great experience from all of you. I hope you have a great session today. And I'm really looking forward to learning how the, the course is gonna go and hopefully meet some of you in person. Thank you, Councillor Bailao. Over to Manjeet Singh. We really appreciate your comments. Thank you for joining us, Anna. Thank you. Manjeet Jita, over to you. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Deputy Mayor Bailao, for your leadership and support of Civic Lab CEO and our collaboration with Toronto's eight world-class universities and colleges, represented here today by students, faculty, and staff. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first Civic Lab TO Common Curriculum Session. As you can see, it's a virtual experience this year. However, as we reopen public spaces, 
we invite you to come back to City Hall and experience municipal decision making in council chambers and also connect with the amazing city staff you will be introduced to through these sessions. I'm Benjit Jida and I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at the City of Toronto. And in the spirit of getting to know the city, I'm going to tell you a little about my office and our Civic Lab TO initiative. Strategic Partnerships is placed within the City Manager's Office, where it supports innovative public and private sector collaborations that advance community and city building goals. As Deputy Mayor Bailao said, we know that the challenges that face cities like Toronto and the communities that live here are complex and multifaceted, and that multidisciplinary, multi-partner and multi-jurisdictional approaches are needed. Because of this, Partnerships are a really important part of our work and the delivery of the services we provide as a city. We know we cannot do it alone. Actually, we shouldn't do it alone. Complex challenges and great opportunities require us to work across institutions to leverage expertise, skills, resources and innovation. As an example, some of our partnerships include a social medicine initiative where we've partnered with the University Health Network and the United Way to build new affordable supportive housing on hospital lands, integrating the provision of clinical supports provided by UHN and social supports provided and funded by the city and United Way. We've also created a range of business partnership programs that include a green market accelerator program that provides an opportunity for green industry businesses to test their products and services within the city environment and an unsolicited proposals process that aims to invite and engage innovative business ideas to enhance and improve city services. Philanthropic partnerships, these are really important. So philanthropic partnerships help us enhance city services and programs. These funds and supports don't replace the responsibilities, but they help us do more. Over the pandemic, these partnerships facilitated more than $25 million in products, including food, furniture for rehousing, laptops for youth, children and seniors, as well as funds and services to support some of our most vulnerable communities that were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And Civic Lab TO, our formalized collaboration between the city and Toronto's eight public universities and colleges. This partnership was approved by City Council in 2020 through a report called Advancing a New Culture of Innovation and Partnership. You should all go to the City of Toronto website and our clerk will be talking, John Elvidge will be speaking about that and how to sort of find these reports on that site. So this partnership is intended to engage you, the next generation of leaders in city building and the academics, researchers, innovators and leaders from each of the eight partners here today. It is our hope that you will help us rethink, plan for and rebuild cities that are equitable and inclusive and where we all thrive. Our partnership work with Toronto's post-secondary institutions under the Civic Lab TO banner includes a senior leadership table comprised of the city manager and the presidents of all eight universities and colleges. This esteemed group of civic leaders is forging a path forging a path of partnership and innovation between our organizations. This work includes the development of a new model for the city and academia to collaborate on multi-partner, multidisciplinary research that informs public policy and programs. The Civic Lab TO Academic Summit to be held this November 23rd and 24th. We, all, we invite all of you to join us. This will provide an opportunity for academic, faculty, students, city staff and government representatives to join a series of virtual panel discussions led by leaders from academia and the city and focused on city challenges and city opportunities. And this, the Civic Lab TO Common Curriculum building the civics capacity of the next generation of leaders. During the common curriculum discussions and related civic lab TO programming, you will hear from our speakers about the policies and strategies that guide their work, the programs they lead, the partnerships they have built, and the key questions facing all of us as we collectively rethink and build a more resilient and equitable city. 
You'll also hear about the collaborations, research and opportunities to work together to achieve these goals. We hope these conversations will provide insights into the inner workings of City Hall, the incredible people and programs serving the city, and highlight how city academic partnerships can and do contribute to stronger public policy, innovation and city building in a changing urban environment. So my thanks to Centennial College, Ryerson University, George Brown College, OCAD University, Humber College, Seneca College, the University of Toronto and York University. We are proud to partner with you and on this initiative and all of the Civic Lab TO initiatives. And my thanks to Jeff Moore and my team who's led the complex planning and logistics to bring these city sessions together. I look forward to our discussions today and those to come. So thank you for joining us. And now back to Joe to introduce the city manager. Great, thank you very much, uh, Manjeet. We appreciate uh, your comments and your work on this uh, project and the work of your office. We'll pass the baton over to uh, Chris uh, Murray, who is the city manager. And as mentioned before, the city manager's responsibility are broad and overreaching. His role is to basically pull all the departments together to work together uh, following uh, council's instructions to make sure that things happen. Over to you, Chris. So thanks so much, uh, uh, Joe, and uh, thanks, Manjeet, and uh, and Deputy Mayor Bailao. Um, yes, my name is Chris Murray. I am the city manager for the city of Toronto. I joined the organization back in 2018, and prior to that, I was city manager in uh, in Hamilton for about 10 years. So I get asked the question all the time, you know, what does a city manager do? Uh, what role does the city manager play? And really the best way to describe it is I am the bridge between council and the mayor and what amounts to about 38,000 staff. Um, so I'm the person that uh, the mayor, when the mayor and council makes decisions and they want those uh, decisions uh, acted upon, uh, ultimately it's, it's my job to make sure that the 38,000 people that work for the city of Toronto carry out those uh, those directions and do it in a, in a very uh, high quality manner and very cost efficient as well. So um, I have to tell you a couple of things here. Uh, I am so incredibly uh, proud of the fact that we're doing this today because I can tell you growing up, going through the educational system, I learned a lot about the federal government. I learned a lot about provincial governments, was never really told much about what a municipal government does. Uh, so uh, this is our great opportunity to share a bit of uh, what it is that we do on a day-to-day -day basis and hopefully give you an impression of just how important municipal government is in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, Toronto, as you know, is about 3 million people right now, and we know in the next 25 to 30 years, it's gonna grow by another million people, so 4 million people. It is one of the largest uh, uh, cities in North America. In fact, over the last 10 years, it is the fastest growing city in North America. And so, uh, and there are a lot of expectations when it comes to running a, a city government. So first of all, um, we're a very large organization, not just in terms of staff, but in terms of uh, budget, uh, our operating and rate budget, which Stephen's gonna talk about in a few minutes, uh, is annually in the order of about $14 billion. Uh, and from a capital standpoint, and which is the money that we use to build things and to repair things, uh, our 10 year capital program is worth more than $40 billion. So um, when you compare us to other governments uh, in Canada, uh, we are fourth in line. The only ones that are ahead of us is, uh, is the federal government. Uh, as well as the Ontario government and the government of Quebec. So we are a very big organization from that standpoint. The other thing you should know is that we deliver each and every day about 150 different services. So, and you are very familiar with them, I'm sure. Uh, for example, uh, safe drinking water, that's us. Uh, whenever you flush your toilet, where that goes, that's our responsibility. When you think about public housing, that's us. Long-term care facilities, that's us. Public health, uh, as well as waste pickup. Transit, which is done through a, a corporation that's related to us, uh, as well as your streets, your street signs, your street lights, um, as well as city building. So whenever someone wants to build something, 
that's going to be something that we're going to pay attention to and, and have some, uh, some say in uh, so that we build cities in a proper manner. Forestry, recreation, public health, all these things, and this is just a small set of the kinds of services that we deliver each and every day. I have to say this as well. And of course, the elected officials like Deputy Mayor Bailao and, and her 24 other colleagues, plus the mayor, won't say it, but I will say it, and that they have an impossible job. I have to tell you, when you're an elected official at the municipal level, and, uh, and people know who you are, and you go out Saturday mornings to a grocery store and someone recognizes you, the chance of them coming up and saying something awfully nice to you is almost slim to none. So they're the ones that are expected by the voters, by the residents, uh, to look after all the details, all the things that uh, sometimes bother people. They're the ones that they expect is going to resolve all those issues. And so, of course, they will turn to myself and, of course, the other 38,000 people that work for our organization to make sure that we pay attention to the things that need to be addressed and do so in as quick and timely a manner and quality manner as possible. So that should give you some sense of just how big we are, the kinds of things that we do, uh, you know, and, and, and with that comes the, you know, my own journey uh, to get to this position. So unlike, you know, a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or a planner or a, a social worker who has a certain education and ends up with a certain type of job, there is really no university program for city managers. Yes, we could take a, get masters in, in uh, public administration, and yes, we can get masters in business administration and so on. But my colleagues that are in these roles across the country have a variety of backgrounds. Now, mine happens to be uh, urban planning. I am a professional planner. I have a real passion for how cities uh, run, but also how they're built. Uh, so I've got a lot of experience in infrastructure, in particular transportation, but also land use planning and things of that nature. I did spend some time, though, in housing. I must tell you, probably one of the most challenging jobs I've ever had is uh, overseeing uh, services that help people who are homeless and for those that are living in, uh, in supportive housing, uh, in affordable housing. So a very challenging job, a uh, very important part of my career. Um, I became a city manager about 13 years ago, first in Hamilton and now in Toronto. And so it's one of those jobs that I must admit, I never thought I would end up doing, uh, but because of the uh, career path that I chose and, and never being afraid of a good challenge uh, and having worked with some incredible people along the way, um, you know, it's been one of those careers that I must admit when it came out of university, um, I didn't think I'd ever work for government if I'm completely honest with all of you. Uh, and I didn't think I'd work for government because I thought I would be just, you know, stuck at a desk and never given a chance to kind of really, uh, you know, work uh, with people and really develop my skills and do lots of interesting things. I was wrong. I found out when I did join the municipality and to the deputy mayor's comments about all of you that are thinking about careers, um, the, the, the work that we do in the public sector and in particular in a very large city like Toronto is incredibly meaningful. There is no question. And if we've learned anything through the pandemic, we've learned just how important it is to keep the lights on, to keep things moving, to be able to address people's challenges and needs. The city stead, uh, stood up and I think has done a fantastic job making sure that things are, are happening the way they're supposed to happen. So with that, I just want to segue a little bit into what I think is going to be really important for all of us. Um, First of all, the 38,000 people that work for the City of Toronto that I have direct oversight of uh, represent four different generations. So we have people have, you know, very different um, uh, attitudes in terms of what's important uh, and as well as um, represent the full diversity of our community. So that's really important to us that, uh, you know, people that work here, you know, reflect the community that we serve. And not just in frontline positions, but in management positions, right up to the most senior positions in our organization. But I don't have to tell any of you what just has been transpiring over the last 18 months. You know, with the global pandemic, we saw major portions of our economy directly affected. And some of those effects are still felt right now. 
So a lot of us know that if you'd never done any online shopping, I think in the last 18 months, you probably got pretty good at it. And so the retail sector, so those shops where you would buy clothing or you would buy whatever kinds of amenities, um, those shops were uh, restricted in the sense of people being able to buy those services there. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of online shopping and we saw what happened with restaurants. We saw what happened with entertainment. We saw what happened with travel. And a lot of this is still in effect. And so when you start to think of all those businesses that have been directly affected by, uh, by the global pandemic, you start to think about the people that work there. And yes, the federal government did have a program to support people with a basic amount of money uh, each and every month. But eventually that will stop. And so we know that these services that we are so used to that have been affected by the pandemic, that those start the startup of those jobs isn't going to be maybe as quickly as quick as everyone would ideally like to see happen. Um, because we are still, as we know, we're in a fourth wave, thankfully, and I hope all of you have had a, a chance to go get vaccinated. But you know, we are uh, you know, we are still coming out of uh, of the global pandemic. And so I look at all those jobs that are affected and I think about the people in those jobs. And so the, the, the reality is, is that, you know, many of them uh, weren't big income or wage earners to begin with. And many of them were responsible for overseeing or helping support their families. And so they have struggled as a result of this. And so to the extent that we're able to get back into some state of normal, uh, you know, it's going to help a lot of different people. And so the ones that have been most directly affected it is largely affected from a gender standpoint, a lot of women and a lot of women have found themselves out of the workforce or affected by what's happened over the last 18 months in some kind of direct and as well as financial way. As well as, you know, uh, black indigenous people of color that have relied on those types of jobs have been affected as well. So it is, it is, it is marginalized, some of the most marginalized people even further. And so when we look at the middle class, we knew prior to the uh, global pandemic that there were many people starting to struggle and starting to follow that middle class. So now when we start to think about, well, what are we gonna do about this? And so it's really important that people focus in on some of the comments you've heard so far. So as we come out of the global pandemic, as we start to, uh, you know, uh, see the services come back and, and build the economy the way that we want to build it, it is going to be so important that we focus on equity, reconciliation, climate action. And if we don't, um, you know, there will be a lasting effect that I think no one really wants to uh, have to uh, worry about 10 or 20 years down the road. So in other words, what we're looking at right now is what parts of the economy were we doing quite well in before, and maybe we should focus even more so in the coming weeks, months, and years ahead. And when we look at it, uh, we know that Toronto, in fact, the Toronto region, and by that I mean the greater Toronto Hamilton region, um, which is the largest economic region in the country by a long shot, that one of the things that we do really well and have been growing in momentum over the last um, uh, 10 years has been the innovation economy. And so we have organizations like Mars and the universities and the colleges that are, that are starting to train all of you to participate in that innovation economy. And we know in Toronto that the health sector, as well as the climate action sector, as well as the cultural sector, these three subsets uh, of the innovation economy, we compete worldwide in quite successfully. And so, you know, when I stop and I think about Toronto and, and I think about, you know, why people come here, and there's some very good reasons. We have stable government, we have great health care, you know, we have banking systems that are are quite reliable. We have fantastic education systems. You know, I say to my kids, you're, you're one hour away from uh, eight of the best learning institutions in the world. You know, when you think about all of this, and you know what, I mean, we figure things out as a community. We wanna keep this place safe. We wanna address our homelessness challenge. We wanna do all the things that make Toronto a great place to live. And I think that in itself is gonna continue to attract the brightest and the ones that are going to work the hardest and all of you that are listening 
we are in this together. The reason for this program, in a nutshell, is to make sure that you are part of the answer or the solution to what it is that we need to do in the next 10, 20 years. I don't want to wait until you guys are all working to engage you. We want to do that now. We want to make sure that you feel that you're part of the, of the, uh, of the answers that we need in order to be that community that everyone wants to live in, either that or wants to come to and, and contribute what it is that they have to offer. So partnerships at the end of the day, I'll just say this, matter. We've got to get really good at them. We've got to get good at working together, achieving common outcomes. And that's exactly what this program is about. You'll learn a little bit about us as a municipality, but more importantly, we're going to work together on what it is that we can do to really advance this whole innovation economy. And so with that, uh, I just want to turn the floor back over to um, to Joe and uh, look forward to uh, obviously any questions or comments that you have, but also to hear from my colleagues, John and Stephen, who are going to give you more insight as to what it is that we do at the City of Toronto. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for that very helpful uh, overview from the position of a, of a city manager. That was uh, really insightful. Uh, we're now going to turn the floor over to uh, John Elvidge, our city clerk. Uh, before doing that, though, I would uh, remind people that if you do have any questions or comments that uh, you would like to eventually address, we are kind of running a little bit behind now, but we are going to try to finish by 1030. We might go a little over today. We're just kind of learning the ropes here. Um, I would invite you to uh, put in those comments and questions in the uh, in the chat or Q and A function uh, that is on your screen. Um, and for the moment, now we will turn it over to John Elvidge, a city uh, clerk. John, thanks, Joe, and thanks, Joe. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'll save time uh, by just really quickly saying that I uh, like. Uh, uh, like Chris and uh, Manjeet and uh, Deputy Mayor Bailau, we're really thrilled to be part of this today. I think it's a fantastic initiative and we look forward to strengthening the clerk's office uh, role in this project as well. So uh, thanks uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, so my name is John Elvidge, I'm the city clerk. Um, I, with all due respect to Chris, who probably thinks he has the best job in the city, I think maybe I have the best job in the city uh, because I have a front row seat to uh, the interface between uh, the elected officials, the public service, and, and the public at large. And, um, you know, we like to say in the city clerk's office that uh, our job is to make sure that the machinery of government is functioning properly. Um, in the legislation that creates a city clerk, it says that I'm supposed to carry out my job without note or comment, uh, which is a nice 19th century way of saying, uh, to be neutral, and um, that's uh, one of the great things I love about my job is, is uh, you know, I'm required by law to to uh, be neutral and uh, nonpartisan, and um, uh, my commitment is not necessarily to any type of politics or any type of policies at the city. My commitment is to making sure that the system of government that we have. And I'll say the wonderful system of government. I'm a big fan of uh, of the municipal form of government, uh, as you'll see. Uh, my my commitment is to make sure that it runs smoothly, and that all of the actors, all of the players in local government, can do their part uh, to the best of their ability. So um, that's a little bit about uh, the role of the city clerk. Um, I'm going to share some slides. Um, just. Give me one moment here. And now I can't see what you see, so I'm going to, there we go. I'm assuming you're seeing the slides. Someone in the chat will tell me if that's not the case. Um, I wanna talk today, I wanna get, like there's, um, you've probably learned quite a bit about how the city works perhaps in your study so far. Uh, but what I wanna do is kind of level set for everybody. And okay, we can't. See the slides, just hang on one sec. John, I yes. think it's just showing as if you're having low bandwidth, maybe the um, oh. internet in your area. So I can pull up the slides if you like. 
because yeah. I can't see yeah. the video as well. Okay, I'll pull it that up. Would be, that would be great, Rihanna, if you don't mind doing that. Thank you. Uh, okay, so anyway, the slides will come up in a second. What I want to do today, I've called this presentation 10 things you need to know about how the city's governed. Uh, and there's so much more to learn about how the city's governed. But what I want to uh, do is give you sort of 10 foundational points that circumscribe the way the city works and um, uh, talk a little bit about those. So uh, we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, here, this is a little bit about the city clerk's office. There's going to there's a lot of content in these slides, and you're going to have access to them later. So I won't stop and talk about every single one of them. This just gives you a little bit of an idea about the range of services that the city clerk's office provides. You know, the jobs have been around since um, this. The jobs have been around since the city was created in 1834, and it it's. Um, it's a job, it's a, an official to whom the province is given a bunch of responsibilities over the year when there's no one else to assign responsibility to in legislation. It seems it's assigned to the clerk. Uh, so you'll see on the slide, for example, one of the things that we're responsible for is abandoned cemeteries. Uh, you know, uh, which seems like a kind of a, a strange thing uh, to be responsible for in addition to our main functions, which are to elect government through the municipal elections to make government work by running the legislative apparatus of the city, uh, supporting the elected officials in their, in their jobs, and then thirdly, managing information, including records and ensuring access to information and ensuring the protection of privacy. So uh, the, it's quite a wide range. So we'll just go to the next slide, please. Uh, so, Next slide again, we're gonna, these are the building blocks, as I said, 10 things that I think you need to know. So let's start with number one. Uh, let me go through, through some tombstone stuff here. Um, council, uh, or the city, I should say, is governed by the 26 member city council, and that's composed of the mayor, who's elected by uh, all voters in the city, and then 25 councillors who are elected one per ward. Now, uh, just a word about the mayor, for example, the may, uh, the mayor's um, electoral base makes him uh, the elected official who has to face the most voters in this country anywhere by a mile. So we have 1.6 million eligible voters in, city, in the city of Toronto. The candidates for mayor have to face those 1.6 million voters. And of course, uh, I'm not even sure, I guess maybe, uh, I'm not even sure. City, I'm not sure. I don't even think City of Vancouver is that large. Uh, but uh, when you think about, it, you know, the prime ministers and premiers who are elected in their ridings don't face as many voters as our mayor. So uh, we, can, we can definitely say that the, the the mayor of Toronto holds the record for facing uh, the most voters in a, in an election campaign. Our uh, average ward population is about 117,000. The largest ward is Etobicoke Lakeshore. Uh, it's 129,000 people, and if it was a city on itself, on its own, it would be the 13th largest city in Ontario. So our wards are very large. The the, um, the span uh, and scope of uh, issues that the elected officials, elected councillors in each of those wards has to uh, to be responsible for is uh, is huge. Uh, again, in comparison to. Um, almost every uh, large municipality in uh, in the country. Um, a couple of other features about it. We don't have a party system at the city, unlike some provinces. Uh, that doesn't mean that members of council aren't part, or some of them are not partisan or affiliated with parties or connected to parties in some ways. But of course, what it means is there's no, there are no rules or conventions or privileges uh, that are assigned at city council based on party or party status. We sometimes like to say in the clerk's office, we have 26 parties of one is kind of how city council runs. We have some voting coalitions, voting blocks of people that tend to vote together a lot of the time, but by no means is that rigidly enforced. And again, one of the, I think one of the wonderful features about our system of government is at the end of the day, each member of council uh, is able to exercise their rights and duties individually. Uh, councillors are elected for a four year term uh, in a first past the post election. Uh, you may know there's growing movement for alternative balloting methods such as ranked balloting or in, uh, uh, instant ranked, uh, ranked choice, uh, instant uh, balloting. Um, 
the uh, uh, that is not a tool that's available to the city at the moment. It was very briefly available to municipalities in Ontario, but uh, earlier last or last year, I should say, the provincial government uh, took rank choice balloting off the table. So all Ontario municipalities, including the city of Toronto, uh, elect their councils by first past the post. Next slide, please. I should say uh, before we go on that the 20 here are the 26 wards uh, or 25 wards, I should say, and there'd be more detail on the package that's handed out. The um, uh, thing to note about uh, our wards, we're the only city in the province at the moment that is not able to change its wards. Uh, the wards are currently uh, set out in legislation uh, and uh, the legislation that um, took that power away from city, uh, from the city and imposed ward boundaries on us is currently under appeal by the city of the Supreme Court of Canada. We're waiting for a decision, hopefully this month, um, this month or next month uh, to, um, and we'll see what the Supreme Court has to say about that legislation. But we are the only city in the province that cannot control its governance structure, uh, including its ward boundaries. Next slide, please. The, uh, you've probably heard this expression before, the city is a creature of the province. Uh, by now you probably know the constitutional devolution of authority uh, from the constitution to the provinces to be responsible for municipalities. You know, it's sandwiched in section 92 of the Constitution Act right between uh, asylums and saloons, right? Asylums, municipalities, saloons. Uh, and um, the, uh, uh, the, all of the powers of the city uh, are established uh, in uh, in provincial legislation. Um, the principal act that does that is the City of Toronto Act. Uh, it was um, uh, enacted in 2006, uh, and it contains a broad grant of power to the city. Uh, has, the city has the powers of a natural person, which um, was new in 2006. Uh, the act says that we can provide any service or thing that we think is necessary or desirable for the public. And then it says we can pass bylaws in about 11 different spheres of jurisdiction. And those are things like economic development and uh, social development and cohesion and housing and so forth. Um, there's a limitation in our legislation that says we cannot pass something which conflicts, uh, or I love the word frustrates, uh, the um, uh, laws or other legislative instruments of the federal or provincial government. Now, I, I want to dwell on the slide for a second and say that uh, in 2006, when this act came uh, into effect, it was a pretty big watershed for us in the city of Toronto. Uh, prior to 2006, the way municipal legislation worked in Ontario was everything that we could do was listed in uh, the old municipal act. And so we would call that, say, the laundry list of, uh, approach. So before the municipality intended to do something, especially something new that it hadn't done before, or regulate behavior or an, an, an activity that it hadn't regulated before, the city had to go to the act and it had to look to see whether somewhere in that list of, um, of powers and services, uh, the city was able to do it. And uh, so as you got into things like trying, to, if, if I think now about trying to regulate Airbnb or Uber or new things are happening in the economy, uh, we're very fortunate now that we have these broad powers since 2006 because um, prior to 2006, we would have had a hard time uh, trying to fit that, I think, into our, into our governing framework. So um, we don't have a charter, we're not a charter city. We don't have total control over the powers that the city has, but since 2006, we have had a, at least a broader grant and a broader uh, range of powers uh, to um, uh, do things for the citizens of Toronto. Next slide, please. The, um, uh, I mentioned the City of Toronto Act. There is a bunch of other acts that are just listed here. Uh, these are, I would say, the principal, like the principal acts that govern the City of Toronto. Uh, the Municipal Elections Act establishes all the rules for elections for all Ontario municipalities. Uh, 
the Municipal Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act, or MFIPA for short, uh, sets out all the rules around making uh, information accessible uh, by the public. And then the other side of the coin, which is keeping information confidential and private that should be kept private. So it's an interesting piece of legislation because on one hand it says here, everything should be open, which uh, is one of the features of our government. On the other hand, it says uh, here, are, but here are the things that must be kept private. We must keep people's personal information, their health, their, um, their uh, yeah, personal information uh, private. Uh, the Municipal Compact of Interest Act governs the, the um, activities of members of council and members of our boards in terms of their own interests, managing their interests. And of course, the Planning and the Ontario Heritage Act have big impacts on the way the cities govern because they set out the rules in which council will deal with those things. There's a bunch of other acts, but you know these six uh, are kind of the, the major ones that circumscribe our governance structure. Next slide, please. Um, the third point, uh, just to dwell on uh, for a moment, is um, the Act says that the powers of the city are exercised by council and by bylaw. Um, and so, again, that where the authority comes down from the Constitution down to the provinces uh, is passed to the city through the City of Toronto Act, and it's passed to the council. Now, a couple of key features here that I think are really important and key to understanding how the city works. Number one. Council is both the legislative and executive branch of government. So we think about the three branches, legislative, executive, judicial. Um, the council is uh, at all times acting as a body, both the legislative and executive branch of government. There's no separation, right? So there's no one, no person and no body that has executive powers, meaning uh, powers to uh, over and above the legislative body to uh, implement and direct the public service, for example, and implement the decisions of the council. Uh, that's, uh, there's no separate body. Some might think the mayor uh, is, um, might have executive powers, uh, but that's not the case. I'll talk about that in a second. And we do at the city at city have a committee called the executive committee, but it has no executive powers either. It's just a, it is a coordinating committee of the chairs of our standing committees. So uh, this is a pretty important feature here, uh, 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 and a contrast between ourselves and the Westminster governments at the federal and provincial level. Now we're also the big feature is we have a, a weak mayor system here. Now please, uh, well all the people in this. Webex, do not text Mayor Tory and tell him that I call him weak. Uh, that's not what I mean by a weak mayor. Uh, in our system, uh, the mayor, as I said, has no particular additional powers, uh, no executive powers. He is one vote on council. Uh, so a mayor, for a mayor to be uh, effect, an effective leader, the mayor has to resort to other kinds of intangible powers. So the power is his or her charismatic powers, the powers of, uh, or the things that go with being the, the titular head of the organization, the person that people put microphones in front of, uh, the fact that he's been elected by 1.6 million electors makes, is gives him leverage over those who are maybe only elected by 129,000 people. Um, uh, so it's up to a mayor to figure out how to use all those things at his or her disposal to figure out uh, how, how, to, how to wield power in this system. There are no, uh, as I say, there are no uh, uh, formal additional power. He doesn't have a veto. Uh, he doesn't have um, uh, the ability to um, uh, overrule or ignore any things that the council says. He needs council to come with him. Uh, and a majority of the council to come with him to fulfill his or her agenda. Uh, now, I said everything is done by the city, and of course, for practical purposes, that's not really possible. Maybe you come from a smaller community in Ontario, or you have a, a cottage property somewhere in a small municipality, and if you went to those councils, you would see that the council does everything. You know, it 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 maybe interviews all the staff. <laughs> it might hire. It would hire all the staff. It might approve all the all the checks. You know, in a small municipality, rural municipality in Ontario, that's not uncommon. Not practical here, given the size and scope of the city that Chris Chris mentioned. So we have a whole system of delegation 
where authority is transferred now. It's come from the Constitution through the province to the council. It's now being transferred down to city officials in, in many cases or to other, other subordinate bodies. Um, there are some things that can't be delegated in that process. Uh, the city can't delegate its, uh, city council cannot delegate its decision-making powers around budget, taxes, planning. There's a handful of other things, but in the day-to-day -day running of things, the hiring of staff, the paying of bills, uh, those types of things have been handed from down from the council down to city officials to perform those functions. Those are all things that the council could take back, could modify, uh, because at the end of the day, it's their responsibility, but uh, if we're, if we're a modern organization, let's put it that way. Now, I say uh, council exercises all the powers. There are some city officials that get to exercise some powers. Uh, I'm one of them, the clerk in running the election. I can run the, the election independently of council because they are at the same time ca candidates as well as governors. Uh, our fire chief, our chief building official, there's a handful of other officials that do have some statutory powers. I'm gonna have to pick up the pace here, so I'm just gonna go to the next slide. Uh, when I say that the, the authority, if you're researching and you're on the hunt for where that line of authority comes, these are some of the places in which you'll find the delegation of authority in our bylaws, uh, in policies adopted by council, in terms of reference, shareholder agreements with our corporations, and so forth. Next slide. Next uh, thing, oh, I, I always include this slide. In 1976, North York Council was still approving checks in by bylaw. That's just a, that's a bylaw from 1976. Next slide, please. Um, community councils are an interesting uh, feature in our uh, system. Some uh, uh, community councils are, uh, there are four of them. The wards are grouped into districts and the councillors for those wards sit on the community councils. They make decisions about local matters. And in some cases, city council has delegated final decision-making authority to them. So a good example of that would be stop signs. Um, uh, we don't need the full council spending all of its legislative time deciding whether a stop sign should go in a locality. So council has said, community councils, you're the local uh, sub body of this council. You make the decision about those types of things. And in the background material on the slides I've given you, there's some more some more details on that. Next slide. Next thing, key feature uh, is uh, number four, uh, and that is that the public has the right to observe the advancement of city business. And this distinguishes us from Westminster government in a big way. Uh, the principle of our legislation is that you must be able to, the public must be able to watch uh, attend meetings and watch the business of the city be transacted. There are some exceptions, a handful of exceptions, for example, things like real estate transactions where we don't want the buyer or the seller we're dealing with to know how much we're prepared to pay. That can be done, that can be talked about in a, in, a, in confidence, but um, uh, for the most part, uh, meetings are open to the public. So this is a big contrast to Westminster government where we have cabinet secrecy, uh, the doctrine of cabinet secrecy uh, 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 preserves the confidentiality of things that are discussed at cabinet. Not the case. Everything's a fishbowl uh, at the city. Next slide. Uh, the next slide just describes that we even go as far as to when we do discuss something confidentially, we actually make a commitment to release it after the fact when it's safe to release it. And there's, uh, that's what this slide is talking about. Again, I'm going to go a little bit more quickly. Next slide, please. Uh, the city uses city council uses a committee system. Uh, there's uh, a diagram here of our, our committee system. We have uh, standing committees, which are responsible for different areas, uh, spheres of walks of life, let's say in the city of Toronto, whether it's uh, the urban form or economic development, social cohesion, um, uh, transportation and infrastructure uh, programs. And all of the business from the city comes up from the staff, from staff reports and uh, communications from other bodies. The things that form the agenda of city council come up through the committees. Committees consider things and make recommendations to council. So that's different again than uh, Westminster government where new business generally is introduced into the assembly or in the house of commons and then 
those bodies refer things to committees. We're, we go bottom up in the city of Toronto if you're trying to follow things. Next slide. Um, I've included in the package the next slide, which is going to come up, which is really a diagram of how things move through the system. I won't talk about that now, but it's there for, your, uh, to, for you to look at later. Next slide. We do have a series of advisory committees at the city where we get uh, citizen input on a range of topics. Uh, these, um, these committees reflect uh, some of the very pressures and priorities that uh, Chris was talking about in his presentation. And um, this is another way that the public can be involved in city government. Next slide. Uh, we also, uh, it's uh, part of our governance structure is our agencies and boards and corporations. And this is a good, this is, uh, these are bodies to which council transfers some of its responsibility so that we can involve members of the public in shared governance of some of these critical functions. It allows us to uh, obtain business expertise or particular subject matter expertise. Uh, in certain areas of responsibility of the city and uh, devolve and distribute some of that governance responsibility. Um, and uh, some of the boards and agencies you'll be familiar with, I'm sure. Next slide. I've already talked about new business starting and committee. So we can go ahead two slides, please, Rihanna. Um, another key to understanding the city is our cycle. So um, the city council here meets about eight to 10 times per year in a four to five week cycle. That is just like it's uh, the wheels turn. <laughs> and uh, so this will give you an idea about the pace at which business transfer uh, goes through the city. Uh, we start with standing committees and then that ends up in a council meeting and then we start all over again. Next slide. Um, I, I wanted to pause and talk a little bit about this because, you know, average uh, council agenda item here has uh, three, 400 items on it. These things accumulate through that cycle in the month. And um, you might wonder, how do we efficiently deal with all that business? And uh, if you come and watch a council meeting or a committee meeting, you'll see that we use something called a consent system. And so there's a heavy reliance on paper doc or not paper, they're digital now. But there's a heavy reliance on documents and reports that contain recommendations from city officials that go to council. And um, if those uh, proposals meet with the approval of the committees and council and don't require discussion, then they will adopt those items so-called on consent meaning they'll just adopt the recommendations the staff have put forward. And then they'll reserve time to debate. They'll reserve time to debate the things they really want to debate. And these numbers are for council. And I, the, to me, they're really interesting because one of the complaints people often say to me is, oh, that council is just a big debating society. You know, you spend all, all this time uh, uh, debating uh, cats up trees, right? Like that's a very common uh, criticism of our council for some weird reason. Don't think we've ever debated a cat up a tree. but. Um, if I look at the things that actually are debated at council, uh, they're relatively small number, and I would say they tend to be the things that council ought to be debating. We're debating important housing, uh, poverty, transportation, uh, you know, all the things Chris has talked about. Those are the things that float to the top and get debated, and everything, you know, if we think about the mountain where you're debating the things at the top and all the things below, um, generally council disposes of very quickly on the advice of the city staff. Next item, or next uh, slide. Getting close to the end here, number nine, our system is very uh, heavily weighted towards uh, public participation or giving people the opportunity to take part. Uh, we hear from the public at committees or the councillors hear from the public at committees. Uh, our rule is any person may register to speak about any item on a published agenda, those agendas are always out five days in advance, uh, have the opportunity to speak. Nobody screens that list, nobody approves that list. Uh, the, the committee will hear from the people who are registered to speak. And then of course, the other thing is, 
people can write in their comments. We processed last year about seven or 8,000 letters or emails and communications from people about things that are on the council agenda. So uh, there are opportunities to participate. I always like to say this is at the tail end. This is when items are going forward for final decision. And this is in addition to the things that other city divisions do further up the pipe, uh, public consultation meetings, open houses, workshops. There's lots of opportunity for the public to be involved there. But then when it slides into that formal legislative process and is before council for approval, there's one last opportunity for comment. Is this ready for prime time? Uh, are there last minute comments? And then the last slide, I'll just finish, come back on the last slide where I started, which is a little bit about the clerk's role. As I said to you, uh, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll spend a moment on this slide. There, are, um, It is possible to follow uh, council and committees, find all of our documents. I mentioned earlier, the public has the right to see everything. So we publish every single document. It's available at toronto.ca slash council. Uh, and uh, that is a pretty critical research tool for you if you're doing research about the Toronto government. Uh, you can browse and search for items. You can even, if you follow during a council meeting or a committee meeting, we actually post uh, in real time motions and votes as they're being made so you can follow along. We have indexed videos so you can go back and say, oh, I'd like to watch the debate on my favorite item. You can go back and find that in the index, click on it and have a, a wonderful, I can assure you, a wonderful viewing experience to watch the debate that took place on something that interests you. So there's lots of ways that you can follow counsel. So in, in um, uh, it's impossible for me to transmit everything to you in the time I've had available today about how the city works. But I think if you, uh, these are the building blocks that I've tried to spell out today, these top 10 things, the 10th thing, was uh, next slide is just uh, again the um, um, role of the clerk, uh, and finish by saying that you know we like we operate right in the center of that Venn diagram. Our job is to, as I hope you can see, is to make elected officials successful in carrying out their roles. Uh, Chris and the city, uh, the, the Toronto Public Service, successful in theirs, but also sticking up for the rights of the public as well, rights to notice, the rights to participate. And so for us, a good day is when everyone is able to fully exercise their uh, responsibilities in the democratic system and uh, uh, decisions are made to, to reflect all of that input. So um, with that, uh, I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer questions later or by email afterwards if I've uh, piqued any interest in things and I'll turn it back to Joe. Thank you very much, John, for that uh, presentation, that City Hall 101, always very, very helpful. It contextualizes all the uh, other issues that we'll be looking at uh, in the course of this uh, course. Uh, now we'll get on to uh, Steve Conforti. Um, it is 1037. We did want to end around one hour. Uh, so Steve, I'm hoping you can be conscious of that. Uh, put your questions in. We are going to go a little bit over folks, but we'll try to get you out of here between 1040. Well, by 11 o'clock is, uh, I think, uh, a realistic goal. So over to you, uh, Stephen, look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Comforti. I'm the executive director of the city's financial planning division. Uh, I've been in municipal government and finance roles over the last 15 years and what has been an incredibly meaningful and professionally rewarding work. Um, before I start, I would also like to say how happy I am to be a part of this event and thank you all for participating in today's discussion and specifically for your interest in municipal government. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. The city's financial planning division is, primi is primarily comprised of financial analysts that are responsible for supporting each of the city's divisions, agencies, boards, and commissions uh, with key areas of responsibility, including providing timely and objective corporate financial advice, leading the development of the city's annual operating and capital budgets, which I plan to discuss in greater detail today, uh, providing an independent review of the city's costs, benefits, and services. We also monitor and report publicly on the city's spending and performance, uh, and we also provide representation for the city as we engage with external partners on numerous uh, initiatives and files. Uh, for today, I do plan to focus on financial planning's role in the development of the city's operating and capital budgets. As Chris had mentioned, the city's 2021 combined operating and capital budgets totaled approximately $19 billion. 
and is larger when you factor in the full $40 billion plus from our 10-year capital plan. That is the largest municipal budget in Canada and greater than most provinces. Next slide, please. So before I get into too much detail, uh, it's probably best if I differentiate between operating and capital budgets. Each year, the city prepares a single year operating budget and a 10 year capital budget and plan. The operating budget is most often referred to as the budget that covers the day to day expenses of providing services such as recreational programs, uh, curbside waste and recycling collection, daycare, public health, which has been incredibly important through the pandemic, emergency services such as fire, paramedics and police, uh, as well as park maintenance. As long as these services are provided, costs will incur annually and need to be factored into the city's operating budget. The capital budget is a multi-year plan that provides for the total cost of tangible capital assets, renewal or creation. So that is the total cost of constructing, improving or extending the useful life of buildings, uh, equipment, road, transit, libraries, uh, fire and ambulance stations, community centers, waste facilities, water facilities, uh, and other major assets and infrastructure that's required to deliver city services. In developing these budgets, staff must ensure that the budget is balanced. So this means that budgeted expenditures must equal budgeted revenues on an annual basis. This is a key requirement in municipal budgeting. Unlike the federal and provincial governments, municipalities cannot budget for a deficit, meaning our annual expenditures cannot exceed our annual revenue. Next slide. So on the operating budget, uh, as noted, the operating budget supports the day-to-day -day expenses to deliver city services, many of which are provided 24 hours a day and seven days a week. The city is delivering 155 services in 2021, often reflecting the services relied on daily by residents, businesses, and visitors in the city. Um, operating budgets are developed for each city division and agency. As noted, when developing the city's overall operating budget, we must ensure that the final recommended budget is balanced, meaning any added expenses, be it due to inflation or for new initiatives, is offset by either savings or added revenue. This is a key budget challenge, as added costs generally far exceed expected annual revenue increases. To add perspective, the operating budget pressure is generally 400 to 600 million at the start of the budget process while a 1% residential property tax increase only generates 33 million in added revenue. So as part of our efforts to balance the budget each year, there are four fundamental considerations that must be reviewed. The first is costs associated with maintaining existing service levels. This is referred to as our base budget costs and it reflects inflationary cost increases to maintain existing service levels. Um, it can also be associated with the full year impact of initiatives that may have been added in the prior year or costs associated with growth or service demands while maintaining existing levels of service. The second item that we consider is, is options for savings or balancing actions. And this reflects opportunities to offset those base budget increases. Uh, it includes a review of identified budget requirements against expected expenditures for the year, often using prior year spending as a basis for this review. Uh, we also include service efficiencies, meaning opportunities to maintain service levels at a reduced cost. This is an interesting area uh, of review, especially within energy efficiency opportunities that also support climate priorities. Uh, these reviews can also include uh, inflationary increases to user fees, ensuring that the recovery that we do receive from user fees is maintained as our costs associated with delivering that service escalates each year. Uh, the third area of focus on the operating budget is our new and enhanced initiatives. So it reflects areas of added investment to either provide a new service offering or to enhance a level of service that already exists. Over the last four years, $360 million in added annual funding has been made uh, available to add or enhance city services. Areas of investment are influenced by, city, uh, by council direction and corporate priorities. This is evident in recent investments that are consistent with priorities identified in our strategic plan including significant investments in transit and housing, as well as further service enhancements that promote equity and prosperity, continued investments in a well-run city, and added investments in support of achieving our climate goals. The last area that we focus on in reviewing an operating budget is our future year outlooks. And this is a review of the future impacts that are expected to occur based on the current year budget decisions. We'll go to the next slide. 
Um, for our capital budget, so the capital budget provides for the total cost of asset renewal or creation. So the city is responsible for building new assets and infrastructure, as well as keeping its existing assets and infrastructure in a state of good repair. The cost associated with this work is included in our capital budget. The city's assets have a replacement value greater than $100 billion. The 10-year capital plan outlines capital investments required, which fluctuate by year, but average about $4.5 billion uh, annually. In uh, developing the city's capital budget, uh, we again work with each city division and agency, uh, and we consider five capital categories. The first being health and safety requirements, the second legislative requirements, uh, the third is state of good repair, again, keeping our assets in, in a proper state, and I'll get into that a little bit. Uh, we also have growth-related projects and service improvements. State of good repair funding traditionally reflects the majority of capital spending within the city's 10-year plan. Addressing the state of good repair backlog is a key capital priority with over $16 billion in funding directed to these needs over the next 10 years, including significant investments made to address transit infrastructure, uh, which we've actually been able to double over the recent uh, few budgets, uh, and actions to address Toronto community housing building repairs. Even with the level of state of good repair funding, staff continue to project the backlog that will grow over the next 10 years from $6.9 billion to $14.8 billion, continuing the need to prioritize state of good repair funding in our capital plan. Further capital uh, investments are also influenced by, city strategic, by the city strategic plan. These priorities help shape budget decisions ranging from our investments in affordable housing and transit, representing the largest areas of capital investment, um, as well as the introduction of a climate lens in our budget process, um, helping in decisions on how we invest. Examples include decisions related to investments in electric buses as opposed to diesel and ensuring any new facility is, uh, in the city is built to, and developed to our green standards uh, to help achieve our climate goals. Next slide. And the slide after that as well, please. The 2021 budget was developed consistent with our priorities. Uh, in each budget year, we establish guiding principles for both the operating and capital budget. Uh, in 2021, our operating budget had four guiding principles. The first principle was managing COVID demands for city services and the impact COVID is having on our city. Uh, the second was also critical that the budget preserve existing services while needing to account for public health measures. Uh, the third was we also strive for a budget that promotes tax affordability, given the economic impact of COVID-19. And fourth, um, as COVID-19 has highlighted social and health inequities amongst Torontonians, the budget highlights investments in areas that help build back a stronger Toronto. On the capital side, we also had four guiding principles. First, that the capital plan continue and build upon investments committed to as part of the prior year budget processes which included significant increases in state of good repair funding for transit and housing, with other new investments, again, in transit and housing, but also for environmental and modernization initiatives. Our second principle was the importance of our partnerships with the Government of Canada and Province of Ontario, with the capital plan reflecting these valued partnerships to fund vital programs and services, with $4.8 billion in federal and provincial funding leveraged for investments in key areas such as mobility and housing. Uh, third, a key principle was that the budget be focused on a capital plan that is both achievable and affordable. Planning of capital projects includes a lens on what can be delivered within budgeted timeframes. And lastly, the city continues its capital modernization efforts with key focus over the next few years towards development of a capital asset management plan. Um, it was also critical that existing and new partnerships with the province and federal government continue into 2021, especially given the impacts of COVID-19, which I'll discuss uh, a bit further in coming slides. Next slide. So uh, this slide speaks to the budget process and timelines uh, at a high level. So the budget process begins with guidelines and targets developed by Financial Planning Division for use by city divisions and agencies. Divisions and agencies then develop their individual budgets for submission to financial planning. From there, the CFO, with the support of financial planning, holds administrative reviews with divisions and agencies to evaluate the submissions. Ultimately, the city senior leadership team then recommends a balanced budget um, based on these reviews and this analysis that's undertaken. We then launch the budget publicly through the city's budget committee. Um, and from there, the budget is reviewed and considered uh, once approved by budget committee, first by executive committee. And after executive committee's approval, it ultimately is considered by city council uh, where it receives its final approval. 
Next slide. So in 2021, we would have proceeded as usual, except we were faced with an added and unprecedented budget challenge in the form of COVID-19. The pandemic resulted in significant financial impacts to municipalities in the form of added costs and significant revenue losses. Toronto and other municipalities with large transit systems and shelter services experienced a disproportionately greater financial impact as a result of COVID-19. This is evident in the slide we have up now. The chart captures the city's opening budget pressures from 2014 to 2021. The pressures generally reflect growth and inflationary pressures that drive changes in our budget. In the past year, the opening pressure prior to offsets and balancing actions ranged from 270 million to as high as 756 million. But you see, beginning in 2020, you notice the impact of COVID-19 reflecting an added pressure of 1.7 billion originally estimated for 2020 and a further 1.6 billion pressure expected in 2021. Next slide. So the expected 2021 COVID-19 impact predominantly arise from reduced TTC revenues due to ridership impacts um, and added costs within our shelter system to ensure adherence to public health guidelines. There are also reductions in corporate revenues such as parking revenues or our municipal accommodation tax applied to hotel usage uh, and other corporate revenues, as well as added costs to manage our COVID response, both in public health and our long-term care facilities. So next slide, please. So given these challenges, the approach we took in the 2021 budget, uh, we broke it out into three categories. So essentially on the operating budget, we separated out those 1.6 billion COVID impacts from all other budget requirements. We work through our balancing actions and our opportunities to balance the budget outside of those impacts, with the key goal again being to maintain service levels and ensure we're investing in key priorities, as well as maintaining our property tax increase in line with inflation. On the capital budget, we needed to ensure the application of our city building levy to support key investments in transit and housing, and that's a dedicated property tax to support key and critical capital investments. We needed to ensure that our budget was affordable, maintaining our debt service Oops. ratio, which is the cost to support debt uh, that's issued by the city under 15% uh, over the 10 year planning period. And again, have focused investments in mobility, housing, climate and modernization. On the COVID-19 impacts, again, separating out the COVID impacts, securing continued COVID-19 support from the federal and provincial government and developing a strategy impacting available capital funding in the event that COVID-19 funding was not forthcoming. So next slide. So ultimately, 2021 was a challenging budget shaped by the impacts of COVID-19. We've seen added costs to deliver services in a safe manner, while revenue sources traditionally leveraged to offset inflation and growth costs were expected to decline. One of the key principles of our budget was to manage the COVID impacts while also preserving existing services consistent with public health guidelines. The budget also included a further 56 million investment in new and enhanced initiatives focused on equity and building a prosperous Toronto. All of this was achieved while keeping our property taxes affordable. The capital budget reflected the increased city building levy, which enabled us to further advance our commitments towards transit and housing infrastructure demands. And lastly, the budget expected continued federal and provincial support to offset COVID impacts with over 95% or all but 75 million of the required 1.6 billion in funding being received or committed through the first six months of 2021. Um, so that's all for me. Uh, thank you again for your interest in municipal government, and I'll turn it back to Joe. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your comments on uh, on understanding how the money side of a uh, city hall works. Uh, we're starting to wrap up. We're closing in on 11 o'clock. I do want to give, though, uh, and make sure that uh, students have an opportunity to ask uh, questions, that there have been some questions that have come in via the Q&A and chat functions. Um, and so I'm going to invite each of you, uh, each of the three uh, folks of uh, Chris Murray, uh, the city clerk, John Elvidge, and Steve Conforti, one question, but here's the key. You have 30 seconds, not more than a minute to answer it. So to Chris Murray, the question would be, and I'll, I'll give all three questions, and then uh, you can each uh, take, uh, take a minute to answer and then also wrap up. Uh, what are the big uh, challenges and strengths for communities and neighborhoods in the city of Toronto that you see for the next 10 to 20 years. To the city clerk, the question that came through is, is this structure of municipal government that we have in Toronto, is that typical for municipalities in Ontario, 
perhaps you can go beyond that to Canada and uh, globally from what, from uh, your knowledge. And lastly, to uh, to Steve, uh, around there have been some questions around the deficit and whether cities are allowed to go into deficit and what their strategy might be to, uh, to uh, not go into deficit. Over to you, Chris, for final comments. One minute, clock's ticking. Thank you. So thanks, Joe, and thanks for the question. Uh, I mean, succinctly, we want to maintain a phenomenal quality of life for people uh, over the decades to come. So affordable housing, that's going to be a key issue. We have rising challenges in mental health and addictions. That's a key issue. Jobs, meaningful jobs, jobs that pay a living wage, jobs that uh, allow you to, you know, live out your life in this community in a way that, uh, you know, you can uh, look after yourself and your family. So um, we don't control all of that. We control some of it. Uh, but what's really critical is that we work with all of you, not just students, but community members, and work with our partners, uh, the federal and provincial government. Um, it's what we call a whole of government, whole of community approach. We don't have all the answers. We don't have all the ideas. This is why we're here with you today. And this is what's going to make us uh, continue to be one of the true great urban areas in the world. And uh, if we if we learn to work with each other uh, well, we will be incredibly successful. Thank you, Chris. Over to you, John. Okay, so uh, tip uh, question about typicalness of our system in Ontario. Yes, our system is very typical because we all operate under basically the same legislation. Mostly typical across Canada as well, because we share uh, the sort of uh, the democratic institutional uh, traditions of uh, Britain primarily. Uh, the only big difference in Canada, parties operate in British Columbia and Quebec. They're both, they are civic parties, not the traditional parties, uh, but there are party systems there. Two other models around the world to compare ourselves to. In Britain, parties operate at the, um, uh, municipal level across Britain, and the parties are uh, vertically integrated with the national parties. So they are labor and uh, conserve and so forth. And then the other big model is different in the United States primarily is the so-called strong mayor model models in the large cities where the mayors actually do have executive privilege, executive power, do get to override the council, uh, more of a presidential model influenced by their presidential model. So those are the other typical models we see. Great, thank you, John. Steve on deficits and cities' powers around deficits. Sure, thanks. Um, so, in short, the city is not able to plan for a deficit, so we cannot budget for it to be in a deficit position. We must ensure that any expenditures have a, a corresponding revenue in any given year. Um, I thought there were some questions in terms of what if a deficit were to happen and, and it hadn't been expected in year. Um, the city does do quarterly variance reporting where we report it both to council and publicly. Part of that work is us reviewing not just the expenditures of experience to date, but also what we're projecting to year end. And it gives us an opportunity to work with our different programs and, and agencies in terms of identifying where there may be some risk of deficit uh, to occur and managing that within the overall city budget. Um, further to that, we do have some reserves that are set aside uh, uh, tax stabilization reserve being the largest one in the event that there was an emergent or unforeseen circumstance that we would have to fund. The challenge is those reserves are limited um, and, and are only a one-time source uh, and it would need to be addressed in the following year if those expenses were to continue. Great, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, we're closing in on 11 o'clock and uh, to give a, a thank you, a good student thank you to the speakers, the excellent presentations from the City of Toronto. I would invite um, Shan Shergill, I think he's on, to uh, give a good um, a good thank you. Shan, are you on the line? Are you in? See him. Oh, there you are. Guys, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, yeah. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Shergill, and I'm the president of the Federation of Urban Studies Students at York University. On behalf of this session and York University, I would like to take the time to thank Manjeet Jita, Chris Murray, John Elvidge, Steve Conforti, and the Deputy Mayor Anna Bailoff for joining us today. Discussing local governments in major cities such as Toronto is necessary in order to understand the importance of their roles, responsibilities, and purpose when governing a city. 
Um, these discussions highlight the importance of having elected local governments as you know, they represent and respond to the needs of the citizens. So thank you again to the speakers once again. Great, thank you very much, Shan. Thank you every, everyone for attending. We'll see you in two weeks uh, when we will have a new presentation on the theme and we will be guided by George Brown by uh, Leslie Wee. Thank you very much for attending. Have a great weekend, everyone. This will be online within the next week.